Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The ones who are obsessed with the love of Allah, the ones who are obsessed with coming to know Allah, the ones whose focus and intention is focused on Allah, they suffer many difficulties because so many things come in the way of their knowledge of Allah. So many things distract them in their desire to come to know Allah. They know that the only true knowledge is the knowledge of Allah. Everything else is worldly. It is said there is direct correlation between knowledge and ego. The less knowledge you have, the more ego you have. So those who are full of themselves lack understanding, lack truth, lack knowledge of themselves. But we have to realize that everything we see has depth to it. Everything we see is more than meets the eye. In the daytime, we have the sun. And the sun brightens the whole world. But at nighttime, there's also a light. And that light is the moon. And that moon helps us to be able to navigate the light. And man has so many different qualities within him, one after the other, after the other. And he goes through them. He learns from them. He sees them, and he gets stuck on them. Man is born pure, but as soon as the body forms around him within the embryo, as soon as he comes out into this world, he becomes polluted. He becomes other than that purity that was. He takes on the arrogance, karma, and maya of his parents. He takes on the elemental forms which make up his body. Now remember, before he was a body, man existed, he existed without a body. He existed in a formless space. But once he takes on the body, now he is form. And the arrogance of form influences his being. So he takes on the arrogance of earth, the arrogance of fire, the arrogance of water, the arrogance of air. All of these influence him and corrupt him. And as he walks through life, he walks through all of the creations that have happened in this world of illusion. And every one of them has powers. Earth has powers. Fire has powers. Water has powers. Air has powers. The mind, ether, has powers. And each one of them proclaims itself as being the strongest, the mightiest, the most important, the one who is powerful over all. 
But in truth, fire is powerful, but water will quench the fire. Earth has so many powers, but if floods come, they cover the earth and the earth isn't seen. As air blows, the mountains disrupt the air. They don't allow it to flow freely. They stop it. And so it is between the elements. They have an enmity towards each other, and they all impede each other. Now, we have all of these elements within us. And all of the qualities of all of these elements we have within us. And part of what we have to overcome in order to return to a state of purity is to overcome all of these powers that are elemental, that are within us, including all of the other powers that we have. It's difficult for man to be witness to illusion and to differentiate between the two. From the time men grow into whatever family they're in, they are given a religion. They are given a culture. They are given a language. They are given so many things to hold them in place in a certain way. All of the past generations are there to influence the present generation to become like the past generations. The past generations are trying to hold you in place. They don't want you to change. They don't want you to escape. Now, in this world, for people who have an interest in religious studies, for those who have an interest in God, the normative course is to go to some kind of school of divinity where they teach you about God. But in truth, what is it that they teach you about? They teach you about their books. They teach you about their philosophy. They teach you about their way of seeing things. And then what do you get when you're finished? You get a title. <laughs> you're either a priest or a minister or a rabbi or a guru or a sheikh. But they don't give you God. And if God is what you're looking for, these things won't give it to you. Does God have form? Yet all of these schools teach in form. They teach the form of the religion. They teach the darkness of the religion. They teach the separation of the religion. They teach the differences of the religion. They teach the differences and the separations of that religion from all other religions. And without being specific about a religion, you can be sure that each of them, no matter what they are, will tell you close to the same thing. My way is the right way. My way is the only way. For salvation, you must come my way. You must go through my path. You must adhere to my rules. You must follow my regulations. In truth, none of these things can satisfy the true seeker. None of these things will take you on the path towards God. If you are to become a true student, then to be a student on this path towards God is to be in a different way than a student 
in any other path. In the world of illusion, knowledge is cumulative. You have picked up knowledge here and knowledge there, and you use that knowledge to further yourself because it all mounts on top of each other in your learning system. In the learning system to find God, it begins with giving up your religion, giving up your books, giving up your ideas, giving up everything that you've learned before and starting from the beginning all over again. If you hold on to what you know, then you're not really a student. You come as a teacher because you already profess that I know this and I know that and I know this and so on. But to find, go on this path, to go on the path towards Allah, you have to start at the beginning again. There's a very famous story of Rumi, Jalaluddin Rumi, also known as Mevlana, uh, the one who wrote the Maznavi, in his first meeting with Shems, his teacher. And Mevlana had with him an animal, a horse, a donkey, something that had all of his sacred books with him. And within a couple of minutes of meeting Shems, Shems approached the animal, took the books that the animal was carrying for Mevlana and threw them all into the river. Uh, Rumi, of course, became very, very upset. And Shems asked him, why are you so upset? And Rumi explained to him that all of his knowledge is in these books. And Shems explained to him, the knowledge that's in the books is not going to do you any good. You have to become the truth. You have to know the truth. And the truth isn't found in books. But Rumi continued to carry on. And then Shems pulled the books out of the water. And he showed them that they weren't damaged. They weren't even wet. They were fine. And then Rumi began to realize there was something else going on here beyond what it is that he could comprehend. And he got to the point where he was willing to listen to Shems and begin to learn. Rumi was at that time the highest jurist within the land. He was considered the man who knew the most about the law, the one who could interpret the law and take people on the straight path. And Shems basically told him he didn't know anything yet. He only knew book learning. And book learning is not the way of this path. To become a student, one can't be a teacher or a master. One has to be empty. But also, to become a student, one actually has to pay attention. It's not enough to show up for class. It's not enough to show up in school. Lots of people go to school and don't learn anything. Lots of people go to school and don't pay attention to anything. To transform yourself into a student means to listen to the teacher. But in this case, in the case of true spiritual knowledge, not only do you have to listen to the teacher, you have to begin to understand that the teacher's words are not just knowledge, they are commandments. They are words that you have to apply to your life as if they were critical for your being. If you take them lightly, 
if you don't pay attention to them, if you don't use these words as guideposts for your own existence, as instructions for the way that you act on a consistent basis, you're not really a student. You're just auditing the class to see what needs to be said. There has to be more going on. What is being taught and what is being said when you're with a, a wise teacher has to be absorbed into your being and has to become part of you. You can't be big and learn in this school. If an elephant comes to an anthill and steps on it, he can destroy the anthill. But a little ant can crawl up the trunk of an elephant and eventually kill that elephant from the inside. True knowledge, reality, is a small point. And you can't bully your way into understanding that point. You can't push yourself into knowing that point. That point is subtle and small. And in order for man to be able to understand that point, man must become subtle and small or else a voice will come to that man in that school that says, you don't belong here. You don't have the appropriate mannerisms to be here. You don't know how to act here, and therefore you can't be taught. The true student is small. And the true student stays small. We must understand at all times that what it is that we're trying to learn in this university, in this school, is to learn about our creator. And we must also understand that our creator is beyond our imagination. Our creator is beyond what our mind can know. Our creator is great is a, is a power that's greater than any power in this world. And there is a method to come to know that creator, but that method is not through the usual learning methods that are employed in universities and in colleges. What happens is you sit in front of a professor in a university, he says certain things, you write those things down, they then test you on those things, and if you can repeat what it is you've been told, then you are given a title because now you have obtained a certain amount of knowledge that you can reiterate, that you can explain, that you can say again. But in this teaching, in this understanding, there is more than repetition of words. There is the becoming. When you see a man, he may appear to be just a man. You see a, sh a wise sheikh, he looks like a man. But if you spend time with him, and if you watch him closely, you will see that there's much more to him than ordinary man. You will see that his actions are actions that are godly in their nature. You'll see that his qualities are qualities that are godly in their nature. You'll see that his form 
is the form of Rahman, the form of compassion. So he is not just man. He is man transcendent. And transcendent in what way? Transcendent in a godly way. So we have to understand that if we are going to fulfill this intention of ours to come to know our Lord, if we are going to fill, fulfill this desire of ours to come to know our Lord, there has to be a change within us. There's much talk of reincarnation. There's much talk of being born again. Well, every one of your thoughts is a new birth. Every one of your thoughts is a new way of understanding something. And unless it is an understanding of God, it has to be voided and discarded. So as we learn about the world, we must look into ourselves and learn about ourselves. If we understand the religions, we understand that we have to go through each one of them. And as we go through them, we have to discard them. Because if we stop at the point of religion, we have stopped at the point of intellect. And intellect cannot know God. Intellect stops at philosophy. So if we are happy, once we reach philosophy, we are not going to find truth. We are just going to know philosophy. And philosophy is conjecture of the mind that tries to make reality out of illusion. And reality can't be made out of illusion. Reality is somewhere else, and it is something else. And to find reality, we have to leave illusion. So our birth into religion has to be reborn, and we have to discard it. Our birth into culture has to be reborn, and we have to discard it. All of our book knowledge has to be discarded. Everything that we've learned that is attached to arrogance, karma, and maya has to be seen, looked at, and discarded. We have to discard everything we have ever gathered in our lives until all that is left is our intention for Allah. All that is left is our desire for Allah. All of our other desires have dissipated and disappeared, been looked at and thrown away. This is the path towards purity. Now, the path toward purity is not easy. And often, conclusions are drawn that don't seem to be rational in the world of illusion. There's a story of a great saint who was very attached to one of his children. And his child met an untimely death. And in his mourning process, M-O-U-R-N, the saint realized that this child was keeping him from his true intention, which was God. And then he thanked God for taking his child away. Now, in that process, he also was wise enough to understand that Allah was taking care of his child, that he didn't have to worry about his child, that Allah is the one who takes care of all things. And what good 
does it do us to worry about these things? There's the story of Moses who was on his way to Mount Sinai and his wife was pregnant at the time. And his thoughts, instead of being on his Lord, were on his wife. And Allah called to Moses and he said, Ya Musa. And Moses didn't respond. And he called again, Ya Musa. And Moses didn't respond. And he called again, Ya Musa. And this time Moses heard and his mind stopped paying attention to what he was thinking about, which was his wife. And Allah said to Musa, kick that little rock next to your big toe of your right foot. And he did. And there was a frog and a blade of grass and dew was on that blade of grass. And so the frog existed there and it had water and food. And Allah said to Moses, Musa, the one who knows that frog and has supplied food and water for that frog, don't you think he is aware of your wife and her condition? And don't you think he will be taking care of her? And like that, we can't be overly attached, even to our children. We have to be able to let them go into the world and know that Allah cares for them and Allah will care for them and take care of them. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't stay in touch with your children, doesn't mean you shouldn't talk to them, but worrying is of no uh, moment, it is of no benefit, it doesn't do any good. Worrying is believing that something difficult will happen in the future and you're feeling that pain now. It has to do with fear. We have to give up those fears because Allah is in charge, we're not in charge, and our attempts to be in charge are futile. So what we need to do is release our worrying, release our fear, release our pain, and allow Allah to control the situation. And as we allow that to happen, then the children become free and we become free and everyone can move forward to find their truth. Now, when we move on this path of constant rebirth, where we give up each and every single thing that we've accumulated in this world, like Rumi's books. And we understand that all that we've accumulated has to be let go of. Then what we find is what's left in reality, what's left in truth. And when you strip away all of illusion, when you strip away everything that's not real, when you strip away all the falsity of this world, when you strip away all of the form, when you strip away all of the darkness, when you strip away all of the powers, when you strip all of that away, what are you left with? You're left with Allah's essence. Allah's dot. And what is his essence? What is his dot? What is it that we're left with? Well, he created us out of his love. So we're left with love. But we're left with so much more than that. Because Within Allah's love are his 3,000 gracious qualities. Within Allah's love are his 99 beautiful names, his 99 enormous, gorgeous powers. So all of the powers within this world are 
secondary to his power, are of no consequence to his power. His power overwhelms all of the powers within this world. His power overwhelms all the powers within the earth, all the powers within fire, all the powers within air, all the powers within ether, all the powers of our mind, all the powers of our desire, all the powers of our needs, all the powers of our efforts, all of those are very, very small and without consequence to his power. All the powers of the sexual arts, all the powers of the sciences, all of the powers that we conjure up, all of the magics, all of the illusions, all of these fade just like every light fades when the sun shines. The sun overwhelms every star in the sky. So all you see is the sun and God's power is like that. It overwhelms every other power. It overcomes every other power. It is from him that those powers exist. And if he wishes to do away with them, they are done away with. So we have to begin to live, leave life in illusion and begin to live life in reality. It is said that the Ketubs, which are the axis between heaven and earth, that are sent into this world by Allah to assist man in understanding the truth. It is said that these Ketubs come from the light and are manifested in this world to look like man. They are manifested to look like man so that man can understand the possibility of what it is that he can become. So these ketubs act as a mirror for man of his possibility. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that if we can find a ketub, if we can find an insan kamal, a true man, that man is here for a purpose. And that purpose is to show us who we should become, who we are in truth, who we are when we are purified. So as we walk through this earth, as we walk through the world of illusion, we are not real. We are something other, but we are not real. We are an amalgam of thoughts and ideas that come from our mind that try to represent who we are. But all of that is a shell, a casing, a cover over the truth of who we are. And the truth of who we are is that soul that God put within us, that purity that God put within us, that original portion of ourself that God put within us. And anything else that we've accumulated during our traverse through this world isn't real. And our purpose here is to find out what is real. So we have to stop creating this persona that we've spent so much time on. We have to stop worrying about this persona that we've spent so much time on. We have to let go of the ego that thinks it exists by itself. 
it doesn't exist by itself. As a matter of fact, it doesn't exist. If we're going to exist, we're only going to exist in reality if we understand the truth of the unity of mankind, if we understand the truth of the unity of all existence, if we understand the truth of our unity with our creator, if we understand that our creator alone exists. And when we disappear into him, that's when we become real. So we have to shed our skin. We have to shed our ideas. We have to shed our personalities. We have to shed our culture. We have to shed everything that we've accumulated all these years that we've traveled this earth and we have to become pure again. And this can be done. And that's why the Ketubs are sent onto the earth so we can see what it looks like. And what it looks like is love. What it looks like is kindness. What it looks like is generosity. What it looks like is acceptance. What it looks like is forgiveness. What it looks like is a constant giving to make us more and to make us real. We have to understand that. And we then have to do the work that it takes to become that. The Sheikh, the Guru, the Insan Kamal, the Ketub is here to show man who man truly is. And our work is to become that. So the Sheikh says to us, become like me. And that's not a joke. He means that if you are to fulfill your birthright, you are to become like him. And then you have no life of your own. <laughs> your life is to aid the rest of the world. All of a sudden you see man, but in truth, inside of that man is God's vice regent on this earth. The one who does God's work on this earth. Once we understand that. Once we know that, once that becomes our intention, once that becomes what we strive for, then we become real. May we all become real. May we all come to know the truth. May we all come to know our creator. May we all come to know that reality. Amin, amin. Ya Rabbi Lalameen, Assalamu Alaikum, Arahmatullah wa Barakatuhu.